Please note that this session is being recorded. Welcome. My name is Dr. Bandy Lee. I'm a forensic psychiatrist with 25 years of experience serving as an expert witness for the criminal and civil courts, and nothing could have ever prepared me for the abuse and violence I came to see through the family courts. Violence has been a common theme in my research all over the world and inside prisons. I helped launch World Health Organization's World Report on Violence and Health in 2002 and co-authored the United Nations Secretary General's chapter on violence against children in 2007. So I'm very pleased that the UN Human Rights Council has released a report warning that family courts around the world which routinely ignore and deflect claims of violence against women and children are committing grave human rights violations that amount to torture. I would like to play a clip of the UN Special Rapporteur's presentation. Within the context of child custody cases, there exists multi-layered violence that has yet to enter into the collective conscience of the international community as a human rights issue. One is the violence that is perpetuated primarily against a group of women, namely mothers, a group of women whose concerns the Human Rights Council does not address, in my opinion, as often as it perhaps should. And within this group, women belonging to specific minority groups, including indigenous women, migrant women, women with disabilities, amongst others, are at particular risk of such violence. The other, of course, is the violence perpetuated against children. And the most troubling part is the deliberate orders issued by courts to return a child to an abusive parent, even when there is credible evidence of abuse, and only because contact with that parent was considered more important than any other consideration, including the safety and security of that child. The conclusion of the UN report is that this is a human rights issue, where the custody of children is too often awarded to perpetrators of violence, usually the abusive father, rather than to the loving and supportive parent trying to keep the children safe in a nurturing environment. I'm writing a book on this crisis of family courts. In it, I will illustrate my own family's case in New Jersey. My sister lost custody to an abusive husband who was on a restraining order for seriously injuring their children. The irony is the court ruled that the mother should lose custody because an unlicensed so-called associate counselor didn't deemed her speech to be tangential in answering some of the questions against nine psychiatrists who agreed that she had excellent mental health. This is why she has not seen her children for even one minute during the last two years. When I wrote an article about this, several mothers who had the same experience under the same judge reached out to me, and I was astonished to find that the stories were nearly all identical. All women lost custody of their children to violent abusers. Then, as I started to research about family courts, I discovered that this was happening all around the country and increasingly around the world. So this is how I came to this topic. It has been disturbing enough for me to change my career tra trajectory to focusing on exclusively family court cases, uh, since all my work in violence prevention is for naught, if tens of thousands of children in the United States alone are deliberately being sent to their torment, rape, and murder. And this is not hyperbole. I have decided to stay fully committed until this national and international epidemic of judicial injustice and violence is brought to public awareness. This is a reason for this forum. And I thank you all for participating and we will now turn to the brave mothers. First, we will start with Rebecca. Is Rebecca with us yet? Perhaps Tina, would you be willing to begin? Thank you. 
Thank you. I am I am honored to be here. As a survivor, I recognize my privilege in speaking out. There are so many who are suffering in silence, afraid to speak out in fear of retaliation or are silenced by unconstitutional gag orders. And it is in the best interest of the family court system to continue operating under the veil of darkness. Secrecy has worked in their favor for decades. And today we are raising our voices, sharing our stories, which puts us at great risk. But we must create a collective spotlight to ensure that what is happening is brought to light. So in my case, 14 years ago this weekend, in fact, in the pre-dawn hours of August 29th, 2009, I fled to the women's shelter after waking to a series of terrifying voicemails from my ex-husband that had been left throughout the night. Those messages left me in fear for my life. He was seething with rage, calling me names, threatening me, and said, you are done. He had been mentally unraveling for weeks, and I knew what he was capable of. Um, in fact, two weeks before that, he had stripped my entire house bare, taking everything I owned, even the photos off the walls. And in that same manic state, he redecorated my bedroom, replacing my bedroom set with toddler furniture, a pink bedspread, pink boas, a photo collage that he created of my childhood. It was terrifying. On the bed, the toddler bed that he purchased, he left a book titled The Proper Care and Feeding of Husbands. I am still traumatized just at the memory of what I walked into that day. At our first court hearing, the judge stated, if this is the way you're going to start divorce proceedings, you are both crazy. I was being faulted for his abuse and his behavior, and that was more painful than the abuse itself. Within 24 hours of the court issuing a restraining order granting me exclusive use of the home, my ex-husband violated the order and entered the home. Law enforcement called it a domestic issue and deferred us to the court, but the court did not hold him accountable. And that was just one snapshot into the nightmare I was living. I was harassed and stalked for years, but no one cared. For over a year, I slept with a hammer under my pillow, and I would jump straight out of bed any time I heard a sound in the middle of the night. The abuse I suffered post-separation was more excruciating because it involved institutional betrayal. The systems that I was dependent on for protection were not only enabling him, but they were fueling his reign of terror. They continued to give him the benefit of the doubt because in our present day family court system, parental rights trump child safety. On the day I received my family court case number, I was assigned my own personal terrorist. For over a decade, I endured countless hearings, two separate trials. We were in court 13 times in 2012 alone. Minors counsel was appointed but failed to protect my daughters. Numerous CPS investigations labeled him as a moderate risk, but they did nothing to protect my children. There were over a dozen interactions with law enforcement two full child custody evaluations, and most tragically, criminal court proceedings that spanned five years. We entered the criminal justice system because my ex-husband lived with his older brother, and during our custody proceedings, my attempts to protect my children from my ex-husband were coupled with my attempts to protect my children from his brother. I had overwhelming evidence that both of them were very dangerous. 
the home where my children were court ordered to visit against their will and against mine was a true house of horrors. In 2021, my ex-husband's brother was sentenced to 280 years in prison. His youngest victim was a 10-month-old little girl. He filmed his horrendous acts and was caught with over three terabytes of child sexual abuse images and videos. 14 years later, my story has never changed. My ex-husband was and is dangerous and his accusations against me have never changed. I was alienating him. So I am absolutely grateful to the UN for this report that has been issued and to you, Dr. Lee, for bringing us all together today. Thank you. Thank you very much for so bravely sharing your story. Next, we will go to Kate. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for giving us this platform. And I'd like to apologize to everyone that you can't see me or see my full name, but unfortunately I'm still in litigation, so it has to be that way. Uh, as you can probably hear, I'm from the UK, but I live in Canada. I met a Canadian and got married, gave up my career to live abroad and support his international assignments. Problems started as soon as we married, but he had me thinking it was a result of his PTSD. And so I did everything I could to support him and cover for his behavior so that he could go to therapy and get better, which of course he never did. In fact, he got worse. We had three children and eventually I found out that he'd been attacking them. And in fact, he damaged my daughter so badly that she still to this day wears diapers, even though she's nearly into double figures age-wise now. So after 10 years of marriage and several failed attempts to leave and many threats against me, we finally escaped. That involved a local hospital and a safe house and the help of our neighbors. By that point, I'd been told that his behavior was nothing to do with PTSD and more likely a mixture of cluster B disorders such as malignant narcissism. And of course, most survivors think that when they finally get, gather the courage to escape, that people will help them. I was told in advance by a criminal lawyer that my ex would go to jail. In fact, the police and the child protection services here in Canada, called the CAS, did just about everything in their power to cover for my ex. They refused to tell me what my children had disclosed to them, but they immediately told my ex. They fudged their notes and it took me years to get hold of them. Since they wouldn't charge him, I was told that if I didn't grant access immediately, my ex would claim that I was guilty of parental alienation and I would lose the children permanently. I was on my own. It was the start of the pandemic and thanks to the police and the CAS and the realization that I was in the midst of an extreme trauma response, I felt I had no choice but to grant him access. I was also told that if I granted him some access, his legal attacks would stop and I'd be able to get the kids therapy. None of this turned out to be true. He's continued his legal attacks and no properly accredited and regulated therapists or medical doctors want to treat children whose parents are involved in litigation. And that makes me so angry because it's obviously cowardly and a dereliction of duty. But everyone here seems to either know what family court is like and they don't want the trouble or to be discredited on the stand, or they don't know what it's like, and that, so they think I'm delusional and the children have been brainwashed by me. Either way, it's almost impossible to get them to treat us, and that's even before you have a situation where your ex has to give consent, and obviously in that case, they rarely do. So usually this is the point where the so-called court experts step in, and that happened in my case. And what we've discovered here in Canada is that once you're targeted by family court professionals, there is literally no way out. You're shoved down a pathway where they continually threaten to remove your children and use that threat and your trauma to essentially strip all your assets. So I now belong to several large grassroots collectives here, mainly protective mothers. Almost all of us have PTSD and other health issues as a direct result of the family court. What we found is that the family court industrial complex has evolved into, at best, an asset grabbing scam. Sometimes family court here will endorse Canadian children to be sent to so-called reunification camps where they're brainwashed 
to deny that abuse ever took place. And those happen here or in the US. And so there's a child trafficking pipeline between the two countries. And now we're starting to see the spread of that business model out of the UK and into Europe too. Our only hope is that children are now starting to age out and that they'll speak up about this on social media. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. So Rebecca, shall we, uh, would you be able to share with us? Thank you, Dr. Lee, for raising much needed awareness regarding the criminal atrocities by the family court system. Like many other protective mothers, I have been barred from all access to my children by the family court. It's been nearly four years since I've had any contact with my children. In addition to having my children taken from me, I have also been rendered homeless and penniless by the court and forced to pay child support to the moneyed spouse. This is my punishment for trying to protect my children from their sadistic and abusive father who currently has complete custody and control of our children. This is not due to any mistakes by the family court. The family court is a sinister for-profit corporation that deliberately places children in danger by giving the abusive parent custody, usually the father, while forcing the protective mother away from her children. In my case, the judges, the attorneys, the attorneys for the children, the so-called neutral court-appointed custody evaluator, and even my own former attorneys have fully enabled and empowered my ex-husband to further abuse me and my children via the court system. I have filed numerous motions and oral requests to the family court to see my kids, but I have been repeatedly denied even supervised and therapeutic visitation with my children, despite the fact that I was my children's primary caretaker and their full-time loving and responsible mother. Even convicted murderers and heroin addicts are given supervised visitation with our children. Yet like many other protective mothers, I am being cruelly denied all access to my children. This has caused irreparable harm for me and my children and the grief of being separated from them has been overwhelming to say the least. Not only do I miss my children terribly, but I also worry about them even more. Just to backtrack, I'll share a brief history of my case. Nearly five years ago, after 20 years of marriage, I filed for divorce and for an emergency order protection because my son had disclosed to me that his father had been sexually abusing him since he was young enough to remember. I was naive and trusting then, and I thought that the professionals involved and the judge would be outraged and that they would do the right thing. But that was hardly the case. And instead, what began was a family court nightmare for my children and I. I have still not received a hearing in nearly five years for the emergency order of protection that I filed against my ex-husband on behalf of our children. 11 months after I filed for the emergency order of protection against my ex-husband, I was desperate and at my wit's end because the court refused to give me a hearing. And as a public outcry for help, I posted on social media that our son was being abused by his father. Up until then, I was extremely private about my life and had confided in very few people that my son was being abused. I also posted about the court corruption and the long history of domestic violence that my ex-husband had perpetrated against me, including raping and strangling me. I knew that my ex-husband had other victims and I was hoping that one of his victims would come forward and help my children. I was hoping that somebody would help. Unfortunately, that did not happen. What followed soon after that was that my ex-husband filed for an emergency ex parte order of protection against me for posting on social media. I was not present in court. The judge immediately granted him this unlawful ex parte order of protection, which included gagging me that I may not post anything pertaining to our children on social media. This is a sweeping overbroad order that violates my right to free speech. I was gagged so that the court's corruption can thrive in secrecy. This is how and why family courts have been able to get away with the most horrifying crimes. If they gag the protective parent, then they can get away with anything. I have been lawfully jailed twice, including due to non-harassing, non-threatening, truthful free speech. I have been repeatedly threatened and intimidated by the court and attorneys that if I speak out publicly, then I will be incarcerated again. In fact, my ex-husband has filed another malicious contempt motion against me that I should be incarcerated for the third time for an innocent tweet that I posted. 
and the court is actually entertaining his malicious and frivolous motion. In the last nearly four years, the wrongful ex parte orders of protection have been renewed against me 12 times without my ex-husband filing any motion, petition, or application showing good cause. This is a gross violation of my due process. I have still not received a hearing for the 12 ex parte orders either. In fact, one of the 12 orders of protection was simply emailed to me once without any scheduled court appearance. Furthermore, I cannot even appeal the orders because they are issued as temporary orders. This is done intentionally by the family courts because temporary orders cannot be appealed. There are many more shocking constitutional and human rights violations in my case, but thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to the very short version of my story. Many of our children are not safe, even in their own homes. This must change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Natalie? Would you like to go? Hello, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much as well. Um, I'm also from the UK. Um, my story began in 2016 when my then husband, a former Croatian spy, uh, abducted our children who were then aged just two and a half years old from the UK and took them to Croatia. In the seven years that followed, I've been able to see how the family courts are able to disappear crime and how family court judges operate globally. I've been in family court cases in three countries, Croatia, the United Kingdom, and Switzerland. My uh, primary problem is the Hague Convention on International Parental Child Abduction. These cases are heard in family courts. This international agreement is so full of loopholes that it is routinely used to deny mothers the ability to return their abducted children to unlawfully and in the most draconian way punish mothers who flee to escape violence and to entrap and traffic mothers and children. So I can explain this a little bit using my case. So first of all, the Hague Convention downgrades the criminal offense of child kidnap to a civil matter, which is then heard in the family courts and uh, you can't get the police uh, to call Interpol um, to help recover children. Um, however, this is something that Tina touched on as well, I think, um, I'm not sure that Interpol would have helped either because we are currently seeing a systemic problem of courts and police refusing to take action to protect women and children. So secondly, uh, the Hague Convention is used to violate international humanitarian law where a mother legitimately seeks refuge for herself and her children from violence. After my uh, children were abducted, after years of interpersonal and state terrorism against the three of us in Croatia, I sought asylum for us in Switzerland. But to my horror, I discovered that the Hague Convention and family courts are being used to violate the rights of mothers and children to asylum. This is completely unlawful. And thirdly, in other cases I've come across, uh, the Hague Convention is misused in the family courts to take children who are living legitimately with their mothers in their countries of habitual residence, even when the man requesting this is not the biological father. My children were ripped from my arms by Swiss police in the most brutal fashion and sent to live with the father who abducted them and has abused us all for years. They were treated like objects, like by the authorities. It was the most devastating feeling to know I had gone to the ends of the earth, but could not protect my children, and that this was a serious violation of all of our rights. I videoed that moment and posted it on Twitter, and people have told me that they will never be able to forget my children's screams. I have to bury that memory in a deep box inside me and just keep picking myself up and keeping on fighting. There is very little data on child abductions or the family courts. It's unconscionable that the figures are not made publicly available on outcomes. Imagine if there was no data on survival rates for heart transplants. Decisions made in family courts are as important as heart surgery because when you take a child from their mother, they are tearing their hearts to pieces. This lack of transparency is deliberate to allow the family judges to do what they do in secrecy. Right now, there is a group called Hagued Mums collecting data. Uh, the survey is open. Um, you can find details on social med media, and I'll drop a link into the chat here. 
um, preliminary results indicate that a driver of mothers crossing international borders with their children is the torture they endure in family courts. And I can tell you from my case, having been through the Hague Convention three times, first as the left behind parent, and twice trying to rescue my children from the corrupt Croatian courts, the Hague Convention does not protect mothers, it protects violent, controlling, abducting men. We're looking forward to seeing whether the survey results indicate that this is true again across the majority of cases. As far as I'm concerned, the Hague Convention is operating like the international arm of the family court system. Um, I discovered that the Hague, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, uh, which administers the Hague Convention, deals with issues on, on one hand to do with commercial contracts and on the other with family law. So maybe it's not surprising that children are treated like commodities which are traded for profit. Uh, I know I'm talking high level here, but I believe that we do have to examine the problem from all angles and understand this problem for what it is. And I believe that it's a problem of the civil courts, which are unconstitutional. Um, the family courts are a profit making enterprise, not a justice system. The business model was conceived and is run by an organization in the USA called the AFCC, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. Um, it describes itself as a professional association, but I would describe it as a trade body franchising out a model which has literally been copy pasted across the world. And all of the professionals like judges, lawyers, mediators, psychologists, counselors, custody evaluators, parenting coordinators, mental health uh, professionals, etc., rely on child custody cases for a living. And this is why the cases are taking years to resolve and professionals are in deliberately provoking conflict because while the case drags on, uh, more money rolls into the accounts. And to make things even more profitable, the AFCC provides templates and playbooks uh, just like any other business franchise so that its operators can conveniently um, copy and paste into their own, you know, from, into their own cases. Uh, Martha Albertson Feynman is a legal scholar who wrote years ago that the family law system needs to be um, radically simplified. And if we don't take the profit out of the system, this will continue. If we don't find a way to make judges accountable, this will just continue. Um, a dear friend of mine said, you don't reform a prison camp, you tear down its walls, and you certainly don't put the prison guards in charge of reform. Thank you very much. I have indeed often compared family courts to the prisons that I've studied for 25 years, that the extreme violence that I've witnessed would not be happening if there were any public accountability and transparency. And indeed, many of these have reached levels of scandal, have gone to The Hague, in fact, and been resolved um, as uh, as matters of uh, extreme human rights violations and, and uh, uh, things for which prisons need to be held accountable. Now I feel that the same thing is happening in family courts. Indeed, it is even worse because innocent and vulnerable children are involved. And the violence they endure in their childhood will last their entire lifetime, cause all kinds of medical, uh, psychological and physical problems, as well as um, reduce their life, life expectancy by decades if they survive. And we know that hundreds of children die per year in the US alone as a direct result of family court decisions. The audience is um, probably astonished if you are hearing this for the first time. Uh, but for those who have been in the system, it is uh, well known and um, has been entrenched for decades. But I did want to piggyback on something that Kate said, which is something that we are just now seeing. For many years, I have said, when these children age out of the system, they will be the change. And they are bravely coming forward. Some of them have not aged out yet. And they're doing it at great risk. 
um, you know, pleading for help. And we've seen social media really bring together people, the everyday public who has no idea and the awareness that it is creating and the everyday public looking at us sideways saying, but how could this happen? And, and giving us an opportunity to educate them. This is where the change will happen between the children coming forward and everyday citizens linking arms with us, those of us who have been in this for a long time or have personally lived it or are currently living it. I always say, you know, my children are safe. Finally, you know, it took a very long time, but, and, and in some twisted, bizarre way, we are considered the lucky ones because most children, most mothers cannot say that they've protected their children. Um, and we need the everyday public to link arms with us and say no more and demand better and accountability. And we are seeing a shift because, you know, just this morning, someone from the alienation industry, who these people who are profiting off of childhood trauma that they are directly responsible for are putting out calls to action because they are feeling the pressure from these children speaking out and exposing what they are doing and creating outrage across the world. And, and that is a huge shift. And it's one thing that does give me hope. Yes, I'd like to clarify that the uh, parental alienation um, concept, which the UN has called a pseudo concept, is uh, not only junction science, but it is actually um, a, 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 an excuse for the abuse industry to happen and deflect all uh, credible claims of abuse by stating that the uh, usually the mother is alienating uh, the other parent by making up stories of abuse and inculcating um, concepts of abuse into the child, whereas in fact, Actual science shows that this rarely, if ever, happens. In fact, uh, one authoritative study showed that false allegations of abuse happen at the rate of 0.1%. And yet family courts disbelieve uh, accusations of abuse the vast majority of cases. And, and this concept of this theory that was concocted, this pseudoscience that has been debunked, it is doing in our present day exactly what it was created to do. It was created to be a legal strategy used by men who were sexually abusing their children to turn the tables and blame the mother. And the fact that that theory or concept concocted as a legal strategy has now infiltrated every portion of our court system is it's devastating it's hard to grasp that this is tr real life that this is happening it was the most horrific feeling holding my child and feeling i cannot protect him i felt it was like being in a nightmare you know and that's for me you know i remember as a child how much um, more intensely i felt things you know fears were all consuming you know when I was little and as an adult you know you have perspective and you develop resilience and toughness but for a child to feel trapped in a nightmare like that is um I've seen that there's a question in the question and answer what can we do to take action and um I I, I know that I've um said before um in the United Kingdom we have got an election coming up we think it will probably be 2024 and I, I believe that the um, family court issue um, is sort of percolating out into the media a little bit more. And um, it has been raised in Parliament. Um, the sad thing is that um, it's been raised in Parliament for years. You, you can find records going back decades, you know, that this has been happening, maybe not to the same extent. It's getting worse. Um, we, we're sort of 
uh, I think it was Kate that said to me, uh, maybe about 15 years behind the US and the UK. So there are not so many children aging out. And in the meantime, how many lives are going to be lost and how many childhoods are going to be destroyed? So I completely agree that it's, um, I'm looking at the way that other campaign groups managed to um, deal with miscarriages of justice. Um, I've spoken with people who've said, you need a per campaign group, you need public pressure and you need political pressure. Um, and it's the public pressure that is going to put the pressure on the politicians. So I believe, you know, for us in the UK, it needs to be election issue number one. What are you going to do about the family courts? Because it's a relatively quick win if somebody were to put their mind to it. Can I just uh, pick up on what Natalie said um, and tell you what we're doing in Canada? Um, so the issue we have here with all of this is that, of course, because parental alienation has been seen as a, as a gendered issue, in as much as it's usually the protective mother who's accused of being the parental alienator and therefore it's the father who uh, is making the accusation of alienation, we find that people here are very wary of getting involved because, for example, for politicians, obviously that, you know, that, that um, distances half of their voting base. Um, but we are campaigning very heavily against the use of parental alienation allegations in court. And um, for example, they had the lot, the parental alienation lobby here had quite a lot of success with getting these sort of city pro proclamations in favor of recognizing parental alienation uh, put up. So there would be these small ceremonies and flags would be put up and then there'd be some media coverage and so on. So we got most of those taken down, thank goodness. Um, and then simultaneously, these cities were also being pressured to recognize intimate partner violence and family violence as uh, a public health emergency and an epidemic. So we had this kind of bizarre situation where on the one hand, we had the parental alienation pro proclamations and at the same time, we had these sort of IPV emergency declarations. Um, but I think, thank goodness, uh, the IPV declarations are winning out now. We've also got a petition um, underway. We've spoken to a whole bunch of politicians about this issue and we've got a petition which I'll try and put in the chat if I can. If you're from Canada, you can sign it, please do. Um, and it's basically calling for the Canadian government to recognize uh, that parental alienation allegations are being used this way in court and to ban its use. And for Canada to sort of step up and um, recognize and you know, commit to uh, the fact that it's a signatory of the um, UN Convention um, on children, the protection of children and the various other UN conventions. And Canada likes to think that it's a very sort of, you know, it's got this public image of being a very peaceful country and very um, equitable and, um, you know, very kind to vulnerable members of society. But, you know, I think sometimes it needs a bit of a push to actually see what's going on behind the scenes and to and to make sure that you know is actually living up to these international agreements and obligations that it's signed so please do sign and spread the petition if you can thank you and i'll i'll share a little bit about what we are doing here in the united states cadence law was passed last year at the federal level which is huge because it is the first time the federal government has ever recognized the crisis in the family court system. And in that, it's calling for training for judicial officers and professionals, but it's also calling for a ban on reunification camps, which is a huge focus of the advocacy work I do. We, together with the top leading um, advocates in the United States came together to form National Safe Parents. You can go to nationalsafeparents.org. And the purpose of that organization is to connect people state by state so that they can uh, talk to their lawmakers and get Caden's Law passed in their state. Here in California, we are trying to push it through as Peaky's Law, but it has a lot of the same um, points in there. So I really encourage people to get involved in legislative efforts because 
Otherwise, we're going to continue having these conversations and nothing is going to be done. Um, November here in, in the United States, we've declared Family Court Awareness Month, and we've had tremendous success getting proclamations from hundreds of cities, counties, and states across the country. And it's an opportunity to go into your local community and speak for two minutes about the crisis or three minutes in family court to educate them. And what we're finding is that most people have no idea. They believe that family court is a place to protect children. So it's giving everyone an opportunity in their own community to get this on everyone's radar. And we have mayors and other elected officials who are looking at us sideways confused when we're telling them what is happening. And then their follow-up question is, what can we do to help? They want to support our efforts. And so it's things like that, bringing people together and the education and awareness is a, a huge step in the right direction. Reunification camps are camps that are so-called uh, meant to be therapeutic, but in fact are run by unlicensed people usually, who uh, who essentially take the children children out of their uh, out of the care of the protective parent. So they're isolated from their caregiver and uh, with their abuser. Uh, and often they do undergo torture. They are uh, handcuffed, starved, and uh, made to finally um, uh, agree that their abusive parent is the good parent and they, that they wish to s stay with them. So the human rights violations are just enormous and incredible. Personally, I feel that if there are bodies which are operating, which are responsible for child safety and welfare, which are unconstitutional and dangerous, they should be shut down tomorrow. A moratorium needs to be called on any further decisions you know for example to separate uh, mothers and children against the child's will and um, you know for an emergency package of measures to be introduced you know a rescue package for for victims of what may be one of the biggest miscarriages of justice of all time and the thing that concerns me as well is if the family courts are like this some of those judges I mean, I'm not sure about the United States but um, in the UK the same judges are hearing family cases and other cases. And I've heard the word sadistic used more than once in this uh, discussion. Um, what does it say for the safety of any of us if um, people hearing any kind of uh, you know, legal case in a court uh, have characteristics like that? Um, yeah, I was gonna say something else, but I've forgotten what it was. Oh yes, who, who's the demographic? Honestly, I don't believe that we would alienate 50% of the population, you know, talking about parental alienation and the family courts, because that would be to assume that all men are abusive. I don't believe it's so. I think that many men who hear about this are horrified, absolutely horrified by what they hear. And we have a case in my town right now of a little girl who was found dead uh, two weeks ago. Uh, she hadn't seen her mother for four years. She had been uh, deprived of contact with her mother and it turns out that she's been being abused over a longer period of time and she would, was found dead in her home and uh, the rest of the family, five members of the family, had fled abroad leaving her dead and cold in the house. And we don't know if it's a parental alienation case but it is a family law case. Um, unfortunately, it sounds like there's quite a lot of public interest in finding out what happened here. But it was very heartened to hear that our local mosque, because I live in a um, part of the country where we have quite a, a thriving uh, Asian community, um, had written a most moving piece to express their absolute condolences and support for the mother, you know, who they're actually... I believe in contact with and providing support to her. So it's wonderful to see a community response. I believe that when we get the message out into 
all parts of the community. It could be your bowling club or your knitting circle or anything. Your a religious, um, your, your faith group, sporting, you know, associations. Any human being with a conscience has got to respond to this. This is unconscionable. It has been able to go on because mm. of the secrecy and gag orders and court seals and imprisonment if you were to break them, even social media, that's very common. I would like to add that uh, um, this is a gendered issue um, coming out of uh, entrenched patriarchal leanings of courts, uh, but um, fathers are, loving fathers are also affected. And um, among the dozen or so cases I've seen, one was, one is a father. And um, uh, uh, drawing upon the description sadistic that you have uh, stated, I would, uh, I would agree that there is a component of that. When you have total tyranny over families, um, absolute discretion and total secrecy, as well as access, who will these kinds of so-called courts attract? Well, we can now go to audience questions, perhaps. Um, there, there are quite a few questions, uh, as many as 39. Um, first question, often mothers are blamed for letting, in quotes, fathers abuse the children. What do you say to that? You know, it's an issue that I think it's almost before and after family court, because prior to stepping into the family court system, if you don't protect your children, you could be at risk for criminal um, issues. Or, you know, I have heard from mothers who were told, if you don't leave the abuse, we're going to take your children completely and put them in foster care, you could face criminal charges. And this goes hand in hand with the failure as a society that we are telling victims of domestic abuse to leave the, the abuse and that it is the brave thing to do. And there are resources to applaud their efforts and support their efforts. But then when they actually do that and step foot in the family court system, they're walking in with false hope because that ends when you step into the family court system. Now any attempt to protect your children and you are penalized for that. Nature intended for us to protect our kids, but our hands are tied behind our backs by this system. And so there is a disconnect between what is happening in CPS or DCSF or these other entities, and then the reality of what we walk into once the divorce or paternity case is filed. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you recognize that some children, including those aging out of the system, are still so brainwashed, even some having become abusers already, are not coming out? Or, and remain fully unable to be in contact with a healthy parent and are not even exposed yet to the truth of their own stories because it's hard when our hope is there, yet our stories of injustice don't consider this. Would anyone like to answer that one? Yes, I would. Um, I think this goes back to the situation where you're, you're in a state of cognitive dissonance when you're in a situation of abuse. And so you become almost complicit in your own subjugation because you don't realize what's happening and you're doing your best to hold the family together and all of the rest of it. And so similarly for kids, um, you know, they have to adopt these protective measures in order to make it through the day. If they've got contact with their abuser, then they've got to deal with that in some way. And so, you know, by the time they age out, presumably they're going to be dealing with a lot of mental health issues, um, as well as a very warped view of institutions that are there to protect them and possibly a warped view of the protective parent as well. Uh, so yes, it's very difficult. And I think for a lot of these 
kids, it's going to be a question of once they've aged out, they just don't want anything more to do with this subject ever again, um, because it's too traumatic. In my case, and I know in uh, several other cases personally, my oldest child is over the age of 18, and she's no longer under the jurisdiction of family court. Yet despite that, the family court is still renewing and keeping her name on these bogus orders of protection against me. So even if she wanted to reach out to me, she's probably too afraid. And and I keep objecting to the fact that she's an adult and she should not be on the order of protection uh, because she's no longer under the jurisdiction of the court. But uh, my objection my objections are ignored. And this, I, I know several other mothers that this has happened to as well, where their adult children are being uh, kept and um, on orders of protection, illegally and wrongfully. Yes, it's quite common. Next question. If you have a solution to this horrible mess, what is it? I've been providing expert witness testimony to protective parents in these cases for two years. However, my results have been hit or miss because of the corruption I continue to encounter. I'm an expert in coercive control, and now I'm seeing parental alienation experts, so-called experts, jumping on to coercive control as if it's the same thing. A client last week told me their attorney called coercive control, quote, junk science. Yeah, I have my hand up because that's uh, really interesting. We're seeing this happening in the United Kingdom. And this is the thing that really frightens me about the approach, which is, well, if we just train the judges, then they'll understand. Um, no, they, um, you, uh, American psychologist Ban Lundy Bancroft spent 30 years working in the family court system. And he has said, um, these judges are not trainable. This is willful ignorance. Um, and I wanted to say something that goes back to the thing that I said about constitutionality. If we don't address the problem of um, judges having absolutely no accountability when they make a decision which is completely um, in violation of the laws and disregards the evidence, then we will have failed and we will be in continuing to endanger lives. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was that I do think that we need to take a step back and look at the whole concept of the family courts, the way that it is set up, and have a complete rethink, a service redesign, a complete transformation of what I see as like a sort of Heath Robinson-esque contraption, which is too complicated. I think part of that needs to be reclaiming motherhood because motherhood has been undermined. Um, we, I was shocked the first time I went into family court that my lawyer said, oh, but he has more, just as much right to the children as you have. Well, he'd abducted the children, first of all. And second of all, there is such a thing as a biological bond between mother and child. And there is such a thing as the mother in, as the primary carer. And so in some cases, in my case, I was the primary carer and the primary breadwinner. And all of that's taken away and you're left to feel so discredited and so run down, so inadequate. And I came across a marvelous group in, um, they're actually in Italy um, called Hagia. They study, they're anthropologists, they study um, matriarchies, both present day ones and historical ones. And it was very nourishing to sort of look back at how society can be different. Matriarchy is non-violent. It's not simply flipping patriarchy to make women the dominating ones. It's a completely different approach. And I think we need to, think about how over the last decades with all the rushes to rush to break glass ceilings that mothers have been left behind um yes tina mm -hmm. okay tina yeah i i just wanted to add to the question as well that it's truly it's not going to be just legislative change and i do still believe that there are some judges who the training would help the fact that we do have and I know this is not a popular opinion, but I do believe that there are some judges who are not horrible, you know, corrupt individuals, 
but they are sitting on the bench cradling children's lives in their hands with zero training on the 101 of domestic violence, let alone victim perpetrator behavior and all of these complex issues. So I do believe that you know, some of the answers lie in hitting it from multiple different angles. The media, we are finally, I mean, 10 years ago, 14 years ago, when I started this, you couldn't find a single article written over the span of a year. And right now, the articles, the media is paying attention. And that is creating a shift because when we have the judges who are corrupt or colluding, they're sitting up a little bit straighter because they don't want to be exposed. And so I think that it is different angles. It is our efforts on social media. We have seen a huge impact, especially when it comes to judges ordering reunification camps. Several of the cases that I have been helping to expose those kids are safe right now. And I do believe it's because of the social media combined with the media spotlight being put on these things. So uh, the, the legislative change, the laws are just one part of the bigger picture and strategy behind making these changes. Uh, next question. In the U.S., are there differences in family courts among the states? Are any better than others? Could any of you answer? I would I would share that um, it's really, you know, there are some states, Colorado just adopted Caden's Law. They were the first state. There are some states that I would never want to choose to live if I were going down the family court path. California has become the state with the number one, we are the number one hotspot for these unscrupulous professionals in reunification camps. Texas, Montana, Arizona are following close behind. Florida is another bad one. However, it, it's difficult to issue a blanket statement on any of those. You know, I know that some states are known for more corruption, New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, we have some big issues there. But there are pockets in all areas that even within a state, there could be a pocket where there are good people making the right decisions on kids. So it's really dif difficult to, to issue a blanket statement on a state in particular. But it is concerning that it is seemingly affecting all 50 U.S. states and uh, not only English speaking democracies, but moving on to different parts of Europe and South America and essentially all regions of the world at this point. Yeah, there's not a single state that I would say has it figured out and is truly acting in the best interest of children, not a single one. I could maybe it's just special. contribute. Oh. Um, so I'm so sorry, when I was in uh, Switzerland Please. that, um, I was told that there is a difference between the practices of certain courts. Um, so, so Switzerland is also got a sort of federal structure, um, but it's not dependent on which, which canton you're in, it's dependent upon which court you're at. Uh, and I agree with you, Tina, I think it's good to realise that there is some sort of, um, uh, let's say, you know, not to make too many blanket statements, it's not all good. There is a spectrum, you know, of performance you know of different judges and things and um you know likewise a particular court is not necessarily bad but in Croatia my lawyer told me that she knew of one good judge uh, I don't know if that's right or not she may have just been talking about the city of Zagreb the capital but we can see how it's being transplanted abroad uh, they I think they find people to be sort of protégés they go to the United States they train or maybe from the EU, they go to the Europe, uh, to the United Kingdom and experts come over and train the people abroad. And, you know, so that's how they get it up and running. They're using public money to do this. Right. And here in mm. the U.S., what we see happening is that if you have one pro professional in air quotes who is in the alienation industry, meaning they are profiting off of this nefarious business activity, which I, you know, really do refer to as a multi-level marketing scheme. If you have one individual 
And, and these camps can cost anywhere between $15,000 and $40,000 for a weekend, four days. And that's just the, the brink of it. You know, there are before costs, after costs. I know moms who have spent over $2 million trying to save their children and still don't have custody. You know, so all it takes is one of these professionals to be entrenched in a local court system and a whole ring of collusion forms around them. They know which professionals to defer to, which to bring in to support their efforts. And that is where we really see things go sideways. There's many of these rings of collusion and corruption across the United States. And it's usually involving individuals from the alienation industry. I just want to say that in Canada, uh, we seem to be kind of taking our cue from the US, um, as with so many other things. And I think what happened initially was that, um, you know, as Tina was saying, California is a is a really bad area for all this. And in fact, the AFCC began in a courthouse in California and spread from there. And around the same time, I think um, a Canadian person here who's sort of the mother load of all of the alienation industry and reunification therapy uh, founded a reunification camp called Overcoming Barriers in the United States, along with a bunch of other um, professionals in inverted commas, uh, who then went on to deeply embed themselves in Hollywood. Um, people who worked with Brad Pitt um, on his custody case and with Britney Spears on her custody case and so on, all came from overcoming barriers initially. And that lady then came back to Ontario and began sending people to down to the United States to family bridges and overcoming barriers and helped to sort of uh, begin the AFCC um, entrenchment here in Canada so that judges and other professionals, people who were getting their training via the AFCC were, you know, knew who they were and began sending people to them. And if there wasn't, as it were, a direct compensation for this, there was definitely some kind of quid pro quo, um, which is still continuing, you know, so we have, with us, it really depends on the judge. Um, but in Ontario, at least the further west you go, the more corrupt the courts are, apparently. Um, and we all know, you know, who the judges are that you have to look out for. But obviously, none of us gets a choice with which judge we're going to get. And I think the heart of the problem with all this is the notion of judicial independence, because the judges are very, very resistant to any kind of pressure or training or anything else. Um, you know, we've we've brought in Kira's Law here, which um, offers training for judges. And on, an, on a provincial level, the version of Kira's Law uh, requires training for all of the court experts who are involved with making custody decisions and things like that. We, you know, we decided that early on that I think what has to happen is that the judges have to be sort of pressured from all sides in order to uh, respect the law and people's constitutional rights and so on, because otherwise, uh, you know, they cite independence and they don't do it. Parental alienation is not the only tool used by these abusers. Why is the focus on the single technique used to separate a child from a parent instead of the entire techniques and related corruption? For example, abuse of temporary orders, off-record ex parte court hearings, pay for supervised visits, claims of mental illness, etc. The ability of the ability for these abusers and legal professionals to get away with this runs all the way up to the judges, administrators, and legislators that refuse to follow the laws that do exist or to hold back bad actors accountable. Wouldn't judicial accountability be more effective than focus on a single tool used by an abuser? Question. I think it's a risk I've been told by people that, you know, the, just focusing on parental alienation is, is a, a risk that we are failing to deal with the actual pertinent issues. That's my my feel, feeling about constitutionality and accountability. If public awareness is key, which demographics do we target first? Men, women, mothers, fathers, young, old, etc. Family Court Awareness Month in November. I encourage you to get involved with that. Take if you're in a different country, 
expand it out. We would love to see everyone coming together. We have seen huge, huge progress made when it comes to awareness. And I believe everyone needs that awareness. Um, I think advocating for legislation is wonderful and it's really effective at shining the light uh, on the corruption. But at the end of the day, um, the the root of the issue is that the judges disregarding the law. So regardless of whatever legislation is in place, they will just ignore it uh, and do whatever what you know whatever they please. So I do agree with judicial accountability being first and foremost a priority. Absolutely, thank you. Any other answers to any other questions? Reunification therapy is part of the pipeline. If you go to alienationindustry.com, we actually created a, a pipeline diagram that shows how this works. And the families that are most at risk are where there are financial resources, because if you do not, you know, I feel like that is one of the reasons why my children are safe today is because I did not have financial resources for them to go after. Had I been in a better position financially. And so it's going to be different from ev for everybody. I'm not saying that every child in reunification therapy is slated for a reunification camp, but it is part of that pipeline that we have identified and it is very predictable. And so it is one stage in that. Unfortunately, this is in another area where my opinion is not popular and I know it is much easier said than done, but there is an incredible amount of strategy that goes into these cases. And unfortunately, this is a system that penalizes us for being emotional when we have a right to be emotional about protecting our children and really learning your court system, understanding the players, understanding the rings of collusion and being strategic when you are talking to that reunification therapist because they do tend to hold a lot of power. And so I believe, I do not believe reunification therapy should exist. It's in the exact same category as these camps that are traumatizing and terrorizing children. For Dr. Lee, do you have any thoughts on the pediatricians and other medical doctors who are consulted as part of the family court processes through the custody evaluations who choose not to get involved by ignoring or refusing to evaluate abuse symptoms? What can be done what can be done to educate the medical profession about their contribution to these custody outcomes? Uh, well, to answer that one, it's 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 well uh, in our educational system. We know how to report and we know how to recognize signs. What medical professionals are finding is that when family courts are involved, our mandated reports do not count. Uh, in fact, there have been psychiatrists I know of who have gone as far up as the Department of Justice and they have tried, they have championed their uh, their clients and yet nothing gets done. They can be retaliated against. They can be targeted for their license because a judge is involved. And so uh, less ethical professionals quickly learn that whenever a family court is involved, uh, they had better get in line. And in fact, um, in my sister's case, the pediatrician has gone far as far as to fabricate and um, fraudulently uh, concoct uh, her medical records in order to say that the children are just fine. So uh, it just speaks to the level of the, the size of corruption we are fighting against. Can I just say, yeah, I wanted to just share that um, very recently I went to a conference on public health and spoke about the family courts and people were completely shocked. The amount of support that I got was um, amazing. So I think it is a really good angle to um, speak with people who are in the healthcare professions who maybe do not have contact with this problem and to raise awareness in that arena as well. Yes, absolutely. Is there anyone doing a study and tracking the outcome of the children that are in these situations, gathering data on how this trauma has affected them into to adulthood? My son died by suicide, I believe, as a result of his trauma from his father in the family court system. 
uh, actually, if I may, um, I'm going to call for help from the audience or anyone who knows of any organization or individuals who have who can create a national database that data bank by state, the decisions of each judge uh, that will be collected on the internet through a website. The inherent bias of each judge can be shown on the internet based on the decisions they've made and the judges can be held accountable. We would have the names of the judges and their rulings. We're looking for a way to demonstrate every judge's history. This has been done with immigration courts and I believe it could also be done with family courts. Um, so uh, any of you who have any ideas, you can reach me at Bandy, B-A-N-D-Y, at BandyLee.com, B-A-N-D-Y-L-E-E.com. I think that the the biggest issue at the heart of the corruption are the gag orders and the secrecy. And the only way to dismantle the family courts is to abolish gag orders and for it to be open and there shouldn't be any secrets. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest issue right now in the family courts. Kate? Yeah, so in Canada, we felt that what we're seeing here is that the problems fall into three main categories. One is transparency, the other one is regulation, and the third one is accountability. So in terms of transparency, yes, I think, um, you know, if there was more, if there were more eyes on what was happening in family court, then, you know, judges would be, and family court professionals would be more beholden to uh, behave properly. And the other issue is that um, in Can Lee, our legal system for tracking cases, uh, apparently the judges or the, the family courts get to choose which of those cases go on Can Lee. And of course, they're used to set precedent. So they're, you know, even from the start, they're deciding which cases are going to shape the future of the litigation uh, in Canada. So there's that. And then there's also the issue of reporters in courts. And I know that maybe Natalie can speak a bit to this, but the UK has had a, uh, a fantastic pilot scheme to put, um, to make, I think, five of the family courts open for uh, court reporting, which I would love to recreate here in Canada. But the issue is um that it's very expensive to put reporters in courts and you know those days of that sort of journalism are maybe on the wane and also there are the confidentiality issues which everybody in family court always cites as the as the issue for not making these things more public um and you know the media are very wary of reporting on these issues um in case they get sued or you know there's pressure from above in these organizations to to nix the stories because they're just too complicated so yes transparency is a huge one the other thing is you know access to justice issues with people buying their transcripts you know the transcripts are so ludicrously expensive that it puts them beyond the reach of most people to be able to get those transcripts and then very often the judge will decide whether the transcript can be released or not. It's not a given. And sometimes they'll ask to make changes to the transcript. And apparently that's allowed as well. Uh, so these are all issues of trans transparency, which I agree is, is a huge issue. Yes, excellent. If the family courts are a private corporation, do they still have legal protections from litigation against them? And if so, what can be done to hold them accountable? That, that is a huge part of the problem we're all dealing with is that there is complete, complete immunity. You cannot sue these people, and that's why this continues. And when we have judicial organizations coming out with guns blazing because they don't want judicial education, you know, I, I hate to be the Debbie Downer of the group, but I don't see judicial immunity happening, taking that away in our lifetime. I just don't see it. Especially when it's up to the judiciary. Yeah. Natalie? This is why I feel that this is a, a political and democracy problem, because I believe the judiciary are undermining com public confidence in themselves. Um, and then we really have a rule of law problem. And uh, I think it's up to the politicians to get a grip of, on this and the public to push for that. Otherwise, I'm not quite sure where we're heading. Can you please explain to the audience the impact, quote, unregulated experts have on protected parents' cases? 
Also, how Caden's law is poised to change, how these experts are leaned on by judges. I personally believe that's a huge, and I'll let Kate jump in also, but I think that's where the AFCC is very problematic. They are perpetuating this pseudoscience of alienation, and we have people who are deemed as experts when they are not experts. You can't be an expert on pseudoscience. You know, one of these individuals testifying as an expert, her credentials are that of a life coach, and she is trafficking children into reunification camps with her testimony. And so that is one of the huge issues and, and something that Caden's Law will help with because it's going to raise the bar on what is considered to be an expert or who is. And when they are unlicensed, they're not under supervision of any licensing board. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's complaints filed against many of these people and no one can do anything about it because it is not a recognized industry. They're not governed by any licensing body. Kate? Yeah, I was just going to add that the way it works here is that they manage to position themselves so that they fall in a sort of gray area of regulation in between uh, medical and education. So they will say that they're therapists or, you know, they, they give the impression that they they have these, uh, you know, medical credentials and that they fall under the same very rigorous standards of, um, you know, professional conduct and regulation that medical professionals do, whereas in fact they're actually uh educational and well they're not even really educational a lot of them have uh social work credentials or phd uh you know library research credentials rather than actual clinical uh proper healthcare credentials and uh, you know they very often they're unlicensed so that they can't there is no follow up and i mean here in ontario you need a license to be able to cut hair you need a license to be able to sell kittens or puppies uh, or sell cars, but in order to, you know, be a custody evaluator or a um, reunification therapist, you don't need any any of those sorts of qualifications. You just need to know the right people. What is your opinion, Bandy, on uh, abolishing judicial immunity and criminal sanctions for legal malpractice to clean out family court? Uh, well, I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, the question is, uh, who can institute this? I think it's really left up to us and the public. Could Bandy speak to the fact that courts have fully dismissed the tender use, quote in quotes, with regard to mother-child bonds? Um, yes, well, the way I understand it is that uh, with every um, with every right that women have gained or every recognition uh, that children have gained, uh, all of those measures have been turned on their head to harm women and children. So uh, so I think the tender years doctrine is long gone, uh, at least 50 years in the past. Family court, in quotes, at least in California and Oklahoma, is run by gangs and cartels. You cannot reform a system like this. This is organized crime. Can you please touch on this or will this be covered at a later date? I was going to say, actually, that it's um, somebody's mentioned the child protection system. Um, so you, I, I believe there's uh, somebody called uh, as a psychologist who's talked about the three planets model where you have such a different experience depending on which uh, part of the system that you're talking to. The child protection system is you've got to protect your child or we'll take your child. And then in the family courts, um, it's impossible. And so what is happening um, we're seeing that some cases of this that um, the children are sliding into uh, the child the child protection system and eventually being removed from their parents altogether, and that's where the money is really involved. Um, there's a lot of money to be made out of children's social care, which is run by private companies. Um, that we're seeing this is a massive problem that's developing in the UK and uh, it's coming to Europe as well, and that's devastating. It's absolutely tragic. We see. I think two tiers in, in that there are families that are monied, uh, that have a lot of wealth, who whose children are taken away or put in 
crisis, so uh, lots of wealth can be drained from them. But also there are poor families, black and brown families, who, whose children are taken away by child protective services and given into foster care, and that brings in a lot of government money. So it, uh, it happens all the same, that mothers and loving fathers are separated from their children. Natalie. I would just like to say that um, I believe that I feel that a lot of the mothers who become activists are the ones who are maybe stronger, less marginalized, and maybe tend to be white middle class and may tend to overlook other democratic demographics. I think it's really important to keep in mind the most marginalized groups that you have mentioned, including mothers with disabilities, with um, uh, immigration, um, what would you call it, the risky immigration status. So I think we should all try to commit to that um, to make sure nobody gets left behind. Natalie? I just wanted to say I actually dealt with the thing about, I'm trying to put answers in the chat as much as I can, but um, I dealt with the question about uh, shadow bans on social media. If you um, Google shadow bans, you can learn about how you can, should word uh, your social media posts in order not to get shadow banned. Um, um, but that's a, a bit different from the free speech issue and the gagging orders, but I thought it was a useful thing just to know your social media strategies. Thank you for all your work and especially Tina, you are a trailblazer in this detrimental reality. My case had a forensic custody evaluation in which I was stated my ex has strong anger issues and alcohol issues, and he has tormented me and my son who is now seven. My son has an anxiety disorder and PTSD diagnosed. What else can be done? Should I rebel against a judge and report? I'm in Pennsylvania. No, unfortunately, it's a huge risk to come forward just like Rhonda shared in her story, she has been arrested for speaking out. And I know this is kind of a combination of Rhonda's question and this question, what can we do to ensure that we aren't silenced? You take a huge risk when you speak out. When I started my blog in 2011, I had no idea what could have unfolded. I am thankful that I had the rare unicorn judge who did value my right to free speech but in any other courtroom, I would have lost my kids. And we've heard Joan Meyer and many others, Professor Joan Meyer, say until you have already lost your kids or you're at risk of losing your children, when you have nothing else to lose, that's the time to speak out. However, from an advocacy standpoint, we need everyone joining with us. And so that's going to look different for everyone. For you, it may just be simply sharing statistics and facts from Professor, Professor Joan Meyer at the National Family Violence Law Center or other respectable, credible uh, researchers. Maybe that's all you can do right now. It, it comes at a great risk and that could be your children. And so I'm I always feel very protective. I want everyone to speak out, but unfortunately it's not always safe. Okay, last comment, Natalie. Yeah, I was just going to say very, very similar thing, but I think that the seed the system feeds off our fear and our silence. So if you feel that you if it's not endangering your position, um, if you can be brave enough, it could help to bring noise in, enough of, to this movement to be able to uh, try to, you know, um, break it down, you know, to stop, uh, stop things happening like this. Well, thank you. <laughs> We're out of time, but I, I, I will just ask, are there any last minute comments any of you would like to make? You know, I, I just want to say the arrogance exuded by this system far exceeds anything we have ever seen. It is beyond what I'm capable of comprehending. These judicial officers are, with full immunity, are trafficking children in broad daylight. And so when media is covering these stories, share those articles, comment on those articles, 
We need the media. That is our greatest hope. And they track the algorithms and the shares and the comments. And the more we are able to propel those articles forward, the better off we're all going to be. So keep keep doing whatever you can. Thank you. I echo those thoughts and it's really remarkable that we've gone way over time and uh, there are still 110, uh, over 110 questions and comments. Um, this has been the universal response. When I announced my book, I had a thousand messages from sim mothers in similar situations within a couple weeks. And this is the same response that the United Nations received. They said it was unprecedented that they ever received so many calls for input on any topic. So this is obviously a pressing, urgent, critical issue. And thank you so much for joining us today for sharing your stories and and uh, and your interest. Um, on my website, I will try to post the rest of the questions and uh, have a way for people to, uh, a place for people to go to, to either answer questions or, or to find um, other similar questions. Well, thank you once again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And please be open to announcements for future events. We will hope to do this again.